a more technologically savvy teacher for this class. I'm trying. <laughs> okay, I think we're set to go. Hi, I hope you guys have a great weekend. Yes, Mia, do you have a question? Yeah, I just did the uh, proctorial quiz that we were supposed to do, but um, once the quiz is over, yes, it doesn't really give me anything to submit. Um, so I'm not sure if it went through with uh, okay. the second grade. Did you, was there, there was a submit in my math lab, in my stat lab though, right? There was a place for you to submit your work in my stat lab? Well, yeah, once the quiz was over, it just, it gave me the, um, okay. like what I got, right? Okay. Um, then, um, as I understand it, the way you submit in Blackboard, you have to go back to the tab, you know, for the MyTCC Blackboard page. And there's supposed to be a place there that you could submit, but if you don't, it's not a big deal, okay? Because I have, okay. it, I have it set where it will automatically submit your test when the time runs out um, okay. in, in Blackboard, so you don't have to worry about that. But um, if you'll send me an email, and this goes to anybody, if you're worried that the quiz didn't go through and you want to make sure because you're practicing for the test, send me an email and say, hey, you know, ask me if you could, if I could check and see if your quiz went through. But basically, if you can go to your gradebook in my stat lab, and if you see something there for that proctorial quiz, that may not be a grade, it may be an exclamation point, or it may be, but if you see something there besides just a dash, that means it went through. Okay, because I only saw the dash. I didn't see a grade for that quiz. Okay, now if you did, you just do it. Um, I did it yesterday. Um, I did it twice. Okay, remind me uh, right before the break, and I will go on my grade book and see if what I see for you. Okay, thank you. Okay, or if I forget and you forget, email me later when you remember, and then I'll I'll okay. go and I'll email you back. Okay. All right. Thank All you right. so much. Sure, and I can't stress enough about doing that proctorial practice quiz. Um, in my other class, they've already started their test, and I had someone who started the test and had not done the proctorial practice quiz, and he ran into a glitch, and now he's used his one attempt on the test. So do not start the test that, that you're going to take. Uh, it's going to come up this next week. Do not start the test without having first successfully completed the proctorial practice quiz at least once. And I have unlimited attempts there so that you can try different things until you find the thing that works. When you find the thing that works, you know, write it down as part of your notes that, uh, to do that same thing, follow that same procedure for the test. So mainly you're using that proctorial practice quiz to make the test taking easier for you. Okay, all right, let's go on to um, last time. Seems like forever ago, doesn't it? But um, last week we did the section, the measures of variation, which I told you, um, if you found some of that difficult, that's okay, because that's some of the harder stuff we do. We don't really do much that's any harder than that. So uh, don't feel bad. There will be one question on the test where you have to find variance and standard deviation. So, um, and today I'm going to also show you, I think I put on the planner that I was going to show you how to use a graphing calculator, but that's not really useful to you guys unless you have a graphic calculator. So I thought instead we'd go over stat crunch again and see how you can use stat crunch. And I will probably, uh, I'm, I'm going to check and see if on some questions on the test, if I can make stat crunch available. I'll let you know more on Wednesday. Wednesday we will be reviewing for the test and that's all we'll be doing on Wednesday. So uh, this Wednesday I'll be telling you all about the test and what to expect. Um, we'll also do a learning catalytics quiz to help us review and, um, 
and we'll also uh, I'll, I'll tell you specifically like how many questions and whether or not you'll be able to use stack crunch and stuff like that so make sure that you either attend class Wednesday or watch the recording one or the other all right okay so let's go back to the measures of variation 2.4 if you have questions from a previous section save those for the review the review day is free game for any questions but today for the question time here at the beginning we're only going to talk about 2.4 so did anybody have uh, a problem in 2.4 that you would like for me to go over Christina um, it was on questions um, seven and eight and it was uh -huh. for the variance like I got the hard tedious part with to do the standard yeah. deviation but then I was like it's putting it in the calculator again because this is too easy why am I messing this up so can you go through that part again so let me look at that is it okay if I just pull up mine on my laptop my question yes okay so you said seven or eight either one yes excuse okay. me it wasn't the variance it was the standard deviation that's what okay. i was having troubles with okay so tell me on your answer do you have yours pulled up christina yes what did you get for the variance um i've got for the variance it was 0.61 and let's see this particular are you on number seven or number eight seven okay, so on this one it says um it says it's a population i don't know if you noticed that now the reason why that's the reason why that's important is because when you're doing the variance, so population variance is sigma squared, just to review symbols again. So you got sigma squared equals 15.61. The thing that's important about population is that in your formula, and guys, try to write the formula down that you're using every time. And so in the formula you have, to find the variance, you have x minus mu squared, and you divide by n. Whereas if you're doing a sample, you do that same thing. You do the data values minus the mean, and you square those differences and add them. And but you, with it, if it's a sample, you divide by n minus one. So you're saying you did this, and it says, okay. So on the range, what does it say to round to on the variance, Christina? Because I. To the I can't hundred, to the hundredth, I believe. Okay, so what I need to know is, so when you're finding, this is variance here. When you're finding standard deviation, that sigma, which is the square root of the variance, but you're supposed to use the unrounded variance. And then you have to... Um, unrounded i bet you that's what got me good thank you that's possible it sometimes it doesn't make a big difference like once you round it it comes out the same but on a few of them were you pretty close on the standard deviation yes okay so try that so when you do the standard deviation if this was rounded it can make a difference so let's suppose I don't know if you wrote down anywhere on your paper what the unrounded, what it was before that, or if you have any of your work written down. That would be a way we could really narrow this down if you had it written down, which is why I like you guys to write all your work down as well as for practicing for the test. But writing all your work down allows me to help you more in a situation like this. Um, did you happen to have written down the unrounded variance on your paper? I didn't. So I want you all to start doing that, at least on one problem. Um, and if you miss one like this where you're not sure why you missed it, maybe go back and put all your calculations down because then I can look at that and make sure. So, um, but it's possible, see, that could have been 
six, it could have been six zero five or something like that. You see? Or it could have been 15.614. You see, it could have been one of those numbers and it would have rounded to this. This would have been counted correct. But when you take the square root of this, we want to use the unrounded variance here. And that can sometimes make a difference. What did it tell you to round the, st uh, the standard deviation to? So they said to do this to two places. What did they say to do standard deviation? I'm not sure, and I'm not logged into that website right now. Oh, okay. So um, on mine, it's, it's, it's not a huge data set, but um, I'm going to open mine in StatCrunch. If any of you have this problem open, number seven, Actually, I think I, I'm going to try to open this because I told you I was going to help you with stack crunch a little bit, and I want to show you a way you can check your answer. All right. So I'm going to stop the recording here, and I'm going to sh I'm going to try to share my screen. And Christina, if you could keep your uh, you know turn your mic on when I ask a question, so I can be sure that everybody's seeing what I intend for you to see. Okay. Okay. Uh, and that would be really helpful. All right, so I'm going to go to um, share the screen. I'm going to turn off the camera so that that's not in the way. So. I have to sign in, guys. Sorry about that. That standard deviation, Professor Haley Wills, to the 10th place. To the 10th place, okay. Thank you. So, um, so the rounding thing could have been an issue that 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 may have been it but i'm going to look at this um actually i think i will go back and i'm going to enter the assignments like you guys would and we're going to look at question seven is this showing up on your screen? Are you able to see my question? No, nope, that's the wrong thing. Wait, that's 2.5. I went to 2.5, sorry. Assignments. I went to 2.5 instead of 2.4, sorry. I put two questions in 2.5, by the way, that where you can practice showing your work. So question seven. So is this showing up on your screen? Uh, just the, I mean, not the actual problem. Just the question screen. So you're not seeing the actual problem with the data or anything? No, it's just the question screen, questions one through 13, that home screen. Okay, I'm going to try something else then, okay? So hold on a second. So. Now is this now do you see the question? Ha. Huh. Yes. Okay, I figured it out. So, I'm not technologically savvy, but I'm not totally bad either. Okay. So, here you see you're given these numbers and the first thing it asks you for is the range. So, the range is where you take the biggest number and subtract the smallest. So, we can probably do this real quick. So, the looks like the biggest number is 15 minus 2 should be 13. Let me see if it gives me 
I'm not hooked up to my keyboard. Okay, then it says the population mean. To get the population mean, I would add those and divide by how many. So what I want to show you guys is right here, if you hover over this thing, you see the little hand, it says click to copy the table, and I'm going to open that in StatCrunch. I don't know if I'm going to be able to make this available to you in the test, but I might on some questions. <clears throat> However, I will still require you, if I make it available, um, I don't know why that didn't work. That should have worked. If I make this available to you in on the test, then it would definitely be on a show work problem. And I don't know. That should that should open it, and it's not wanting to do that. Oh, there it is. Okay, I just did it twice. So I guess the moral of that story is don't give up. And you see, remember, just to, I'm going to remind you of a few things in StatCrunch. For example, I can say um, sort. Oh, you guys can't see what I'm doing in StatCrunch, can you? I just realized. No, we can't. Okay, then I'm going to have to talk through it. I'm just going to tell you some of the things that I did here. Um, and I apologize for that. Now, one thing, I'm going to try something else again. Okay, so... We'll see if this works. So I'm going to unshare. This is what I did to show you the problem. Let's see if this works. There. This is what opens up in StatCrunch. So a couple of things I've shown you is I've shown you how you can go under data and you can tell it to sort. If you do that, it will put them in order. You have to select a column and you select the column that you want. Um, select. So I'm going to do that column. Ascending means smallest to biggest. And I'm just going to create a new column on that so that you can see both. Okay, so that's one thing I've shown you. So I'm going to show you another thing. So uh, so now mine says sort var1 is that first one. Now another thing I can do is I can go here to stat, and I can go to summary stats. And I'm going to go, I'm going to do a column, and I'm going to, it doesn't matter which one. Remember, they have the same data in them, so you can choose either one. So I can do that, and... The statistics, you can choose the ones you want. Notice it's going to give me the mean, variance, standard deviation. And I'm going to go down here because I think unadjusted variance and unadjusted standard deviation. I think that's what you want if it's a population. I'm going to check and see, okay? So um, if, if I want to add that, okay. And I want the mean. And I held control, guys, to choose that. And I think I'm going to go ahead and tell it to give me the regular variance. And the standard deviation. It asks for the range, so I'm holding control to choose these these things that I want. I'm holding control, and then I'm selecting. So you see how I selected which things I wanted, and then I'm going to say compute. And you see here, um, the mean is 8.3, and I have a variance and an unadjusted variance. And you'll notice that those are different. So um, I'm going to I'm going to write down what I've got there so we can figure out which one it wants when it talks about population. Notice they are slightly different. So hold on a second. I'm just getting a piece of paper so I can write these things down. 
Now, guys, I do not want you to depend on StatCrunch. I want you, but I, I would like for you to use it. You can check your answers using StatCrunch and know before you click enter if you got it right or not. Um, if I allow StatCrunch at all on the test, it would only be on questions for which you have to show the work. And if there is no work, I will not give any credit. Hopefully that makes sense. So you still have to show the work, but I would be giving you a way to check your answer. So I'm going to write down the unadjusted 15.81 and the regular variance so I can tell which one they want, 17.566. OK, and the, let's see, unadjusted standard deviation came out to be 3.9761. Okay, and the standard deviation. I'm just writing these things down, guys, so that we can check it in the problem. And the range was 13, and the mean was 8.3. I just did that real quick, partly so I could show you how to do this in StatCrunch, and partly uh, so that we could get it done a little bit faster. But you would need to show your work, and it's probably going to give me a different question seven. That's going to be unfortunate. Maybe not. OK, so I have to go to sorry, I have to go through a lot of steps to share what I want to share with you. OK, so I came back to that and you see that my range was 13. Remember, the way I would find the mean would be to add up those numbers and divide by 10. So. Uh, for mine, it told me the mean ended up being 8.3. I'm going to check that answer. Okay. Now, this says the population variance. I think the population variance is going to be the one that said unadjusted, I think. So I'm going to try that one first. They want me to round to the nearest hundredth, and StatCrunch told me the unadjusted variance was 15 point eight one which is sort of consistent with what Christina got but let's see if that's what they want okay so that tells me guys that if they want if it says population data set that you want the unadjusted variance if they said it was sample then you would just do variance okay so now when I do population standard deviation I need to take the square root of that. And apparently that wasn't rounded. That must have come out even. So I'm going to take the square root in my calculator. Um, let's see. The square root. I'm doing this in my calculator. Square root of 15.81 gives me 3.96. Yeah, which is what they gave as the unadjusted standard deviation. So it gave me 3.9761, and they want me to round this to the nearest tenth. So let's talk about rounding that. Ms. Haley, okay. how did you implement the calculator to get that answer, that three point? Oh, okay. So in my calculator, um, why don't I show that to you? I'm going to quit sharing this because, you know, I was using this. The main reason I opened this was to, to talk about StatCrunch a little bit. So. Um, I'm going to unshare this and turn the camera back on so I can show you guys, and I'll include that. Okay, so. And what did I do with. Oh, there it is. Sorry. So, let's see. Okay, so to get this variance, just to, I, I, I would like to revisit that. Um, 
to get the variance that I got on that problem just a second ago. I'm going to use mine instead of yours, Christina. And my the variance came out to be 15.81. It said it said, since it said population, what it says in StatCrunch is unadjusted because it's a population. So, and that doesn't automatically come up in summary stats. So to get that variance, let me show you what the work looked like, and then I'm going to show you how to get the standard deviation. So the work would have looked like this. Um, I would have taken each data value and subtracted the mean. So for example, the first data value was 2. I would have subtracted the mean, which was 8.3 squared plus then I take the next data value is 7 minus 8.3 squared. And I have to do that for all of the data values. That's the hard part. And then we would divide by n, which was 10, which is why the variance ended up being nice, because we were dividing by 10. And everything divides by 10. So um, or that all worked out nicely. So we had got that for the variance. And now to find the standard deviation, even if I had rounded that, I would try to take it out several places. And for my standard deviation, I'm going to do square root. And on my calculator, I'll hold it up here. I'll show you on my calculator. So on my calculator, the square root function is the second function on the x squared button, which is right here to the left of the 7 on mine. And so to get that second function, I do second square root. And then I'm taking the square root of this 15.81. And I'm not, that was the whole number. That's not rounded, so I'm keeping that. That was it, right? Yeah, 15.81. And then when I hit Enter, so this was the square root of 15.81. When I hit enter, it's 3.97617, some stuff. I don't need to write all of them down because the directions say to round it. I think it said to round to the nearest tenth. So this 9 is in the tenths place. I've got to round to the nearest tenth. The number after the 9 is 5 or bigger. That means, so this is 5 or bigger. That means we're going to add 1 to the number in the tenths place. If it was less than 5, we would keep the number in the tenths place. But when we add 1 to that, it's going to become 10, carry the 1. And so what I would put in for the standard deviation would be 4.0. Perfect. That answers much. Got it? OK. So I think that's a pretty decent review of variance, which is one of the harder things that we do. If you still haven't gotten it, then go back and watch this recording later. And this is what I do when I'm uh, like when I connect, when I had to create the Proctorio things, I have to watch my friends. She made a video for me, well, for all the teachers. And I have to have that on one device going and then I, I play and pause while I do each step. I did that. I had to do that. Gosh, I think I did it. I had to use, do it that way five times. And then I tried it on my own once to see if I could remember it. This is the type of thing you guys need to do also. So when we have a complicated comp computation like this, it's okay to pull up the recording of me teaching it. And play and pause doing one step at a time until you get it. But then you need to make sure that you can do it without playing and pausing me, that you can do it on your own. So, and it may take, you may have to practice that four or five times before you can follow your own steps. And by the way, a way to get there faster is to show all of your steps on paper. You should only be using my stat lab for answer entry, just to see if you got it right. 
but every problem, all the work should be on a piece of paper, numbered and labeled by section, especially on the test, because if I have any problems with your Proctorio thing, I may request that you email me all of your work. Now, if you haven't put it on paper, you won't have it. And then this will have to be the test you drop. And whatever you're supposed to do on the test is what you should be practicing for homework. All homework should be seen as practice for doing it in a test situation. Okay, like practicing a piano for a recital. All right, so that's um, if you have if you're still stuck on anything with variance or standard deviation, then rewatch this recording later. We're going to go on to 2.5, and 2.5 is measures of position. So we talked about measures of central tendency. That's like the middleness of the numbers, like median, mean, median, and mode. Well, mode, I don't know why they call it that, but it is considered a measure of central tendency. Um, and then we did measures of variation, which was how spread out the numbers are. That was range, variance, and standard deviation. Variance and standard deviation are numbers that describe how spread out the data set is on the mean. And then we have measures of position, which is like where a data value is located in the list. Like, it, is it in the first half? Is it in the second half? Is it in the first quarter? And the first, there's two re main measures of position. And the first one we're going to talk about is percentiles. Now, if any of you have kids, then you know that when you take them to, when they're babies and you take them, they tell you what percentile your baby is in for um, weight, height, um, head circumference for some reason, uh, and, and that sort of thing. Okay, so that's what we're talking about here is percentiles. And what a percentile is, is sometimes they'll write it like this. Uh, let's, for example, if I wrote this, um, Let's, I'm going to put an 80 there just to talk about that. So my first child was usually about in the 75th to 80th percentile in weight when she was a baby. And so um, let's talk about what that means. So that means 80th percentile. And the 80th percentile, whatever her weight was when she was a baby, I don't remember. But, um, oh, yeah. Well, like when she was born, she was like eight pounds and something. And what that means is that for a baby girl of that age, eight pounds and however many ounces was the 80th percentile, meaning 80% of baby girls that age weighed less. So a percentile tells you what percent of the data values are less. So this means 80% of the data values are less than this number. So for example, let's just use hers, and I don't really remember if it was 80th or not, but, um, and actually I have a thing in here that says what she weighs. I think she weighed like, she was like um, eight pounds, I don't remember, 12 ounces, something like that, okay. So, um, and if that's the 80%, if that's the 80th percentile, that would mean 80% of baby girls of her age weigh less than 8 pounds, 12 ounces. And that would mean 20% of baby girls her age weighed more. That's what a percentile means. Now, we have particular percentiles that we're going to look at more carefully called quartiles. Quartiles are just particular percentiles. So, and we have three quartiles. We label them like this. 
And the first quartile is nothing more than the 25th percentile. It's the same thing. It's just another word, another notation for the 25th percentile. So whatever the first quartile is would be uh, the data value where 25% of the data numbers were smaller than that. Uh, the second quartile is the same thing as the 50th percentile. That means 50% of the data values are smaller, 50% are bigger, which means this is also the median. Because that means 50% half are smaller and half are bigger. And then the third quartile is the 75th percentile. So you see they, they just gave special names to the percentiles that divide the data set in two fourths. And they call the first one, the 25th percentile, quartile one, the 50th percentile, which is the median, they called it quartile two, and the 75th is quartile three. So my daughter was pretty close to being that third, uh, her weight was pretty close to the third quartile, a little bit higher probably. So those are the quartiles. Now let's talk about how to find the quartiles. So I'm going to take one of the problems in 2.5, if you'd like to look at it with me, and we'll do the quartiles for that problem. I'm going to do, let me see, I'm going to find one that has a kind of, see if I have one with a small data set. So I'm going to the 2.5 homework. Let's see if I can find one with a Okay, here's one. Uh, this is number two. And I'm going to erase this because I need, I need space. Okay, so. And I'm going to write, in order to find quartiles or percentiles, remember one of them is the median, and to find the median, the numbers need to be in order. So I need to write, for this example, this is number two, so this is 2.5, number two. And I need to put the numbers in order. So, and I don't know if they have them in order for me, but to make this go a little faster, I'm going to open this in Stack Crunch so I can sort them and then I'll, I'll write them up here in order. So, I'm going to sort them to make this a little bit easier. Okay, so, and this is what it looks like. And I'm going to write these. I can't remember what these numbers stood for. There's 55, 56. It looks like there's a couple of 57s. 59, 60. I'm having to start writing smaller because I'm, there's a lot of numbers here. Uh, one, two, three, 62s. That must be the mode. Uh, a 163, a 64, I'm running out of space, uh, 365s, and an 82. Oh, man. Let me make sure. So that I should have 15 numbers here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 12, 13, 14, 15. Now, based on what we did before, remember, notice, uh, let's talk about uh, mean, median, and mode for just a second. So, notice the mode, there's three of these and three of these, that means this has two modes. 62 and 65 are both modes. If I wanted to find the mean, I would add these and divide by 15. But the important thing here is to find the median. The median is going to be the same thing as the second quartile. And this question is asking me to find the quartiles. So this question is asking me to find Q1, Q2, and Q3. Q1, remember, is the 25th percentile. Q2 is the 50th percentile, which is also the median. And Q3 is the 75th. So I'm going to show you it's really easy to quartiles once you have the numbers in order, and that's what I'm going to show you. So remember, there were 15 numbers. So um, that means there should be one in the middle. When there's an odd number of data values, there will be one in the middle. That one number 
will be the median. So it should be the um, eighth one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right here. Notice there should be seven above it and seven below. Yeah, so this is my median right here is 62, which means that's my second quartile. Now, to do the first and the third quartiles, you're just going to do the medians for the two halves. So you're not, since this one was a data value, you're going to just look at this. You're not going to include it in either half. If there were an even number of numbers, then, okay, so you'd have two numbers in the middle, and the median would be halfway in between, and then that means that all of the numbers, the, everything above that number would be the first half, and everything below would be the second half. So here's my top half. The median, because it's one of the data values, isn't going to go to either half, and here's my, actually, my bottom half and top half, because these are the smaller numbers. Then there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I have an odd number of numbers there. I'm going to do the median for that, the halfway place. Because halfway from the beginning to the 50th percentile is going to be the 25th percentile. So if I find the median here, looks like it's right there. Notice there are three, three bigger and three smaller. This is my second quartile or my 25th percentile. So that is 57. And then down at the uh, in the upper half, the higher numbers, again, we have seven numbers. So that middle number there is going to be that third quartile or the 75th percentile, which means 75% of these numbers are smaller than 65. And there are my quartiles. Now, we're going to do something with the quartiles. The first question here, and I'm going to go ahead and put these answers in for mine, just so we can make sure we're doing it right. So I got 57 for the first quartile, 62 for the second, which is the median, and the third quartile was 65. And I'm going to check my answer. Okay, they're correct. The next thing it asks me to find is the interquartile range. So let's talk about what that is. Um, I'm going to I'm going to write this um, differently up here so I can have more room. So I'm just going to write. There's my first quartile. So I'm going to write those up here. Q1 was um, that should say Q1. Sorry. Q1 is 57. The second quartile was 62, and the third quartile is 65. So I've got those answers, and I know those are right. Next thing it asks me to find is the interquartile range. And the abbreviation for that is IQR. And we have a formula for that. The interquartile range you find by taking the third quartile and subtracting the first one. So the third quartile was 65 minus 57. So my IQR our interquartile range is 8. So I'm going to put that in, 8, and that's correct. I'm just checking it as I check it in my math lab. The next thing it asks you to do is find outliers. Now, I have on, I'm going to look on the shared files on your formula sheet. And you see down at the bottom, number eight. 
is the procedure for finding outliers. And down at the bottom, the first step in finding outliers is to find the first quartile and the third quartile. We did that. B, find the interquartile range. We did that. C, multiply the interquartile range by 1.5. So that's what I'm going to do next is I'm going to do 1.5 times the IQR. So I'm going to do that next. 1.5 times the IQR. So I'm doing those steps on how to find outliers. Let's talk about an outlier so you know what we're working on. So when you have a data set, uh, sometimes you'll have numbers that are way smaller than the rest or way bigger than the rest that really aren't representative of the data set. Here, let me point out why that would be important. So when I look at test grades for a class, when I look at all the grades, say, for a particular test, and I find out, let's suppose I find out the average on the test is a 70, and most of the grades are between, uh, say, 55 and 100, and it averaged out to a 70, but I had one grade of 21 or 15. Let's make it super low. So the question I might ask myself is, should I include that outlier? Maybe, maybe I shouldn't include it in the average. Maybe that's not representative of what my students know. Maybe that's someone who wasn't able to come to class or didn't do any of the homework. And maybe that should not be included. Now, I always include them whether they're outliers or not. But you see, this is the sort of decision you might make if you knew something was an outlier. You might decide not to count it. But you don't just arbitrarily say, eh. I think that's an outlier. I'm not going to count that one. No. If you're doing things correctly, statistically speaking, you would want to show mathematically whether or not something was an outlier. So that's what we're working on is to show statistically whether any of these numbers are outliers. Now, just glancing at them, I'm looking at them, and they all look pretty close except for this 82 down here. So I'm going to guess, we're going to go through the process, but I'm kind of guessing that the only one here that might be an outlier is that 82, because it doesn't seem to really fit in with the rest. So that's what we're going to check. That's my gut feeling. Let's see if I'm right. So I'm on part, uh, I think it was C, right? Step C, 1.5 times the interquartile range. So that's 1.5 times 8. And I'm going to work sideways just to give myself more room. Normally, I don't like you working sideways. If at all possible, when you show your work in my, in my stat lab, try to work down. Okay? I have limited space, but you have limited space too. So uh, try to work down, but if you can't, I understand. It just looks better. When you work sideways, it looks like a run-on sentence. 1.5 times 8. So that gives me 12. Okay, so this number is a number that I'm going to use to find something called my lower fence and my upper fence. And the fences, you can think of the fences are what define where the outliers will be. I kind of think of it as if these values are all cows, then all the data values are the cows that are within the fence are fine, but any cows outside of the fence are outliers. So we're trying to find these fences. So we're going to do the lower fence and the upper fence. And this is on your formula sheet as well. So I'm going to go back to that formula sheet. And look at part D. Part D says find the lower fence. And the way you do it is by subtracting that number you just found, that 1.5 times the IQR, from the first quartile. I'm going to write that formula down. That's going to give me the lower fence. And then I'm going to go ahead and write the formula for the upper fence. The upper fence, you add 
of the IQR to quartile three. So I'm going to write these down as formulas. And if you want to write these down like this, that's probably a good idea. So I'm going to stop sharing that so you can see how I wrote this. So you see for my lower fence, I'm subtracting that number. That's my 1.5, that 12 there. I'm going to subtract it from the first quartile. The first quartile was 57 minus 12. And for my upper fence, I'm going to take the third quartile, 65, and I'm going to add that 12. You see where I got the 12 when I did the 1.5 time interquartile range. That gives me for a lower fence, I'm just going to do this subtraction in addition. My lower fence is 57 minus 12, which is 45. And then 65 plus 12 gives me 77. Those are my fences. I want you to look at my numbers. Think of my fences. If my all the cows that are between 45 and 77, they're good. Any cows outside of that fence, those fences, though, are outliers. So notice that 45 would be way up here. There's my lower fence, right? Way up here. And I'm going to draw it like this, because when we draw this on a graph, we're going to do a bracket. So my 45, my lower fence, ended up being way above that one, uh, or way less than, actually, our lowest value. So all of these values are fine, they're fine, they're fine. But my upper fence is at 77, which would be right here. There's my upper fence. Up here, up here at the top between 65 and 82. There's a cow that's not in the fences. Do you see the cow that's not in the fences? The cow that's not in the fences is this one right here. That's my stray cow. That is an outlier. And I've shown statistically that it's an outlier. So this is the process you go through. Now it's kind of, it has several steps, but none of the steps are hard. So that's why I don't consider this harder than say variance, because each individual step is pretty easy. Hopefully you notice that finding the quartiles is pretty easy. Subtracting two numbers, that's easy. Then multiplying that answer by 1.5, that's easy. For the lower fence, I take that first quartile and subtract that number. And for the upper fence, I take the third quartile and add that number. That gives me my fences. All the cows between the fences are fine. Any cows outside of the fences are outliers. Now what we're going to do with this, all of this information, and I wrote, let's see if I have everything written down here. I think so. What we're going to do with all this information, this would be my work. And on uh, your homework for 2.5, there's one question where I ask you to show work where you find your fences your interquartile range and your fences. This is the work I want to see on that problem. So the, what we're going to do with all this information, there's a type of graph we can make with this information called a box and whisker plot. And I'm going to show you how to do that. And I think I have time to show you that. Uh, well, I have, I, can, I have time to show it to you really fast before the break. I do want to check roll, though. So let me do that. If you want to go to problem 2 and 2.5 during the break and try this, that would be a pretty good idea. Let me see if I can find my roll. There it is. So I'm going to check roll. Today is the 14th. Okay. I'm going to check roll. Raise your hand when I call your name. And then... Um, I'm going to go ahead and I'll start talking about the box and whisker plot a little bit, and then we'll finish with that and talk about the other uh, measure of position after the break. 
So let's see, Ariana. Did you guys raise your hands and leave it up when I call your name? Ariana. Um, Cecil. Diamond. Kayla. Kendra. Christina. Mia. Natalie. Um, Samira. Stephanie Garza. Temperance. Tori. Okay, thank you. You can put your hands down. I'm going to erase just this part here. Oops, I still want to identify. We identified this as an outlier because it's outside the fence. And first, I'm going to talk about um, the five number summary. Five number summary is the lowest value, the minimum, Q1, Q2, Q3, and then the maximum value. So if you if they ask me on this question to write the five number summary, I would put the lowest value in the data set. So that would be 55, Q1 would be 57, 62, 65, and the highest value was 82. So that's a quick, that's what uh, five number summary is. Then we have a graph called a box plot or sometimes it's called a box and whisker plot or graph. And I'm going to give you a quick view of what that looks like. A box and whisker plot always has a scale like a ruler that you draw at the bottom. And on this one, our scale, we want to make sure we include all the data values and the fences. Our lower fence, the smallest number evolved here is 45. The biggest number is up here at 82. So maybe I do um, number by tens, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80. 90 say so I'm numbered by tens we do the scale first so that everything will be proportional so it's like we're going to draw the ruler first then for the fences we're going to put um, brackets so at 45 there's my lower fence and my upper fence was at 77 there are my fences. And then we're going to use this, this five number summary. And as long as those numbers are inside, we're going to use them. And what we're going to have is a box with a whisker on either side. So box plot usually looks something like this. And this is, um, this is our min and our max, unless they're an outlier. And, and that's, and guys, don't worry about your box plot so much. Just on this one, it will be fine if you just pick the right one in my stat lab. I just, so we're just letting you know what it looks like. So our minimum value was 55. That's where that whisker is going to start. Our first quartile was at 57. So this is 55, 57. So that first whisker is not very long. 65 is the end of the box. In between 62, it's right about here. Eh, a little bit more over. 
And then notice over here, though, that our highest value is 82, which isn't in the fences. So what we're going to do for that outlier is we're going to put an asterisk outside of the fence. So at 82, we're going to put a little asterisk. I'm going to put an asterisk because it's an outlier. And that means I'm going to end my whisker. It would normally end at the maximum value, but instead, because the max value was an outlier, I'm going to end the right whisker at the next highest number, which was, which was also 65. So that's going to look kind of weird because it's going to be, there's not going to be a whisker because it's the, that last one. That value is the same as Q3. So there's actually be like no whisker on that side. So normally there would be a, a, a little whisker there, a right side. So normally if you look at this, um, you have the min is the start of the left whisker. Then the three lines of the box are Q1, Q2, and Q3. And the end of the right whisker is the maximum. In my stat lab, oh, for some box plots, they would include this. So sometimes they won't show the fences. And they will include that even though it's an outlier. They would include that and make that the right whisker. That's why I'm not picky about this on the test. So we're just mainly learning general things about this, okay, about this box and whisker plot. Uh, so you might try number two in the 2.5 homework. Um, I don't think I put, yeah, it's not a show work problem, so you won't have to do that. And um, then or if, if, you, if you see any other questions in there, just kind of glance through it. And after the break, we can do another one if you want to. But mainly we're going to talk about the other measure of position, which is z-scores. All right. So I will see you back here at noon. All right. So get a snack, take your break, and meet me back here at noon so we can talk about the other measure of position, which is z-score. Very important.